Well, my Aunt Hotep, brothers and sisters, we're back at you live right here on WKHR Radio. And we're glad to be with you because this is a day that the Creator, God and Goddess, has made, and we are glad in it. Don't be shocked that I said God and Goddess. Hey, don't even get it twisted because God created humanity and His and her image. That's why it says, male and female created He them. And you know, many of us want to just say that God is He, that God is masculine, but I got news for you. The reason why the world is so messed up today is because there is not that divine feminine instituted in all of the world as it should be. And of course, I give honor to the divine feminine. I give honor to all of the sisters that are out there. We give a shout out to you. We love you and we appreciate you. In fact, all of the beloved sisters out there, we thank you for being emblems of the goddess. We give you hand praise as well. We honor the brothers out there. We honor all the family members. Got to give a shout out to Dr. Ray Higgins uh, of headquarters, and we appreciate him sitting out the email blast that he did concerning uh, today's show. As well, we honor all of the chief elders and the queens of the chief elders right there in, uh, you know, all over their states, uh, all over the United States. We honor you and we appreciate you. And uh, I want to say that we're very excited about tonight's show, and we're going to dig right into it, brothers and sisters. Even though we have a lot to talk about, we're just going to flow with it, all right? But just before we do, got to let you know that you can get in contact with us during the show by emailing us. I know we used to have the chat room up, and yes, we used to have... Uh, the phone in line where you could call. Hey, it's coming back. Don't worry about it. It's coming back. For But for this show, guess what? We don't have it. The way that you will contact me is you will simply have to email me. And guess what? If you want your comment to be expressed over the air, whether it be a question, whether it be a comment, then I ask that you type your email in red. That's right. Make it red. And that way I will know that it is meant to be read over the air. Just a little joke between you and me. Uh, so, hey, go ahead and do that. I will be checking emails periodically. And uh, I'm tempted to give out my number. Uh, if some of you want my number and you, you do want to call into the station, I'd be happy to give it to you. But I'm only going to give it to those that announce themselves to me by email first. And uh, I want to make sure that I know you, all right? We just want to keep it. Keep it real safe. Keep it real good, okay? Because the number that I would give, of course, would be the number to the studio and to the offices of the African Village here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Also, brothers and sisters, want to let you know, want to remind you that the convocation is coming up and uh, reminding all of the chief elders to to begin their, their, their drives for registration. Uh, yeah, make sure that you at least try your best to get at least 10 to 20 people from your particular state, your particular village, to participate in the convocation in New York. I'm going to go, and uh, it's going to be a wonderful time, and uh, hey, I'm looking forward to it, and hey, we're getting ready for that. Well, listen, what we're going to do, brothers and sisters, is we're going to invite you to run and get a pen, run and get a paper or two because you want to take notes. Now, for those of you that don't know, we will, of course, be um, downloading this onto iTunes so that you can, guess what, you can download it onto your computer, you can download it onto your MP3 player, and you can play it whenever, whenever, like my grandmama used to say, whenever you get ready. So you can go ahead and do that. But just before we... Um, go ahead and, and, and uh, start the show. We're going to do just a couple of things here. We're going to go ahead and we're going to give you an opportunity to, of course, get what you need, get your husiyas, get whatever you need to take notes with, run reference on, and hey, we're going to go from there. But for right now, what we're going to do is we're going to pause for station identification and give you a chance to get ready. And when I come back, it is on. So, hey, get ready to talk about Invented Gods right here on WKHR Radio. It's been said that the best way to hide something is right in front of your eyes. What are the hidden messages and secrets behind the church's architecture and structure? Why is it mandated that only a man can pastor a church? Why is it that the Apostle Paul would say that he suffers not a woman to usurp authority over a man in the church? 
What are the underlying symbols, the esoterics, and the metaphysics behind the church? Now, for the first time, there is a new DVD entitled The Sexual Architecture of the Church. Get it today by going to www.wkhradio.com. You need to get your copy today. Lieutenant McGregor. Now we need some. We need some help, headquarters. I'm. I'm calling you because, well, you know, you've asked us to keep track of what, what, what these people are doing, and beyond all of this African liberation stuff, you know, we 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 we've had all that contained. Okay, I mean, these 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 guys, you know, they're talking about African liberation. Well, we've pretty much got that contained, but. Well, this guy, E.S. Subchurch, he's, he's talking uh, way out of the box, and he's, he's, sir, he's liberating the minds of the people. We need to stop this, and so, uh, uh, sir, please uh, advise us here. He's put out a new DVD entitled, uh, Culture Prison Break, sir. Uh, Culture Prison Break, and he's trying to literally break his people free for good. It, it, it's amazing, but, uh, we need your advice on how to contain him with this. We, we just need help. We uh, we don't know what to do. Um, this new DVD, Culture Prison Break, is... Uh, we've never heard anything like it. So, um, uh, please advise us, okay, headquarters? Um, this is uh, Lieutenant McGregor. And, and please advise us, okay? We, we just need help, okay? Hotel family. I'm E.S. Subchurch, and I've put together another DVD for you entitled Culture Prison Break Part 1. And in this, I discuss breaking free from the last prison and being completely set free. You need this DVD, and for a $15 donation, you can make this DVD yours and add it to your collection. We want you to have it, so go to www.wkhradio.com. And go to the CD, DVD page, and of course, this DVD and many more can be yours for a $15 donation. The concepts that are introduced to you will literally take you out of this world. All right, brothers and sisters, we're right back at you. Thank you for letting us pause for that station identification. And guess what? We're going to get right into our show. Uh, on today, we're going to be talking with you about invented gods, invented gods. And what I want to do is I want to begin, first of all, by just mentioning a couple of gods. And let's see if you are familiar with them. Okay. Now, some of you are going to be because you're comedically conscious, but, but let's just flow here for a second, and I want to make a point. Okay, the first god I want to mention is Leto, L-E-T-O, Leto or Leto. Have you ever heard of that god before? More than likely, you have not heard of that god before, okay? So, got to give that one a record scratch. Well, what about Thales or Thales, T-H-A-L-E-S? Okay, maybe you haven't heard about that god. That god also gets a record scratch. Uh, what about, okay, what about Plutarch? Ah, mm, philosopher, but yes, also a god. Well, you haven't heard about that god. Well, let's just keep this right on going. What about Julian? No, you haven't heard. Now, that's my grandson's name, but you know what? Yeah, he's a god, okay? But Julian, you haven't heard about that god. Uh, also gets a record scratch. Well, you may have heard of Prometheus. You may have, may have heard of Krishna. You may have heard of Brahma. You may have heard of Vishnu and Shiva, okay? You may have heard of Bacchus and Venus, you may have heard of a number of these, but guess what? You know as well as I do that these particular gods are not worshipped in the mainstream of society today. But one of the points that I want to make is, is that at one particular time, the worship of all of these gods was just as strong as the worship of Christianity is today. Now, let's continue to paint the picture because just like today, you got folks walking around proselytizing and trying to win people over to the Lord Jesus, right? 
right? Well, you also had individuals that were very concerned about their particular God and their particular religion back in their particular day. And so you had a number of individuals that were hot and heavy for their God, and so they wanted to do the will of their Lord, whoever their Lord was, and they wanted to please their God, whoever that God was. And even the gods that I named before you, such as Leto and Thales or Thales, uh, you know, these gods, many of us, we haven't even heard of these gods. And really, these gods are not important to us at all. We don't wake up in the middle of the night afraid, you know, uh, sweating and crying, thinking that, oh, my God, uh, I haven't done the will of Leto today. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? Leto or Leto is going to send me into hell. No, we don't wake up trembling about that. Okay, we don't wake up afraid of that. Why? Because the, the preaching, the teaching concerning that particular God has faded into the sunset of time and it is no longer something that anyone is worried about. It has become a matter of historical fact that at one point in time, people did used to worship that God. Okay, now let's just take it a step further. The point that I want to make is that even as the god Leto and Thales and some of the other ones that I mentioned, even though they're not worshipped in the mainstream of religious society today, they once were. And that is the first point that I want to make. They once were worshipped hot and heavy. They once were the mainstream of their country, the mainstream of their city, the mainstream of the populace. Okay, And people worshipped that god fervently, crying, praying, believing for a miracle from that God, uh, believing that that God would save them, believing that that God was accepting their worship, believing that that God was hearing their prayers, believing that that God was watching over them and writing down everything that they did, everything that they said, and that that God took account of their lives. Okay? Uh, those of you listening to me, you have never even, listen, until I mentioned the God Leto to you, you never even thought about that God, okay? Neither did it come up in your spirit, mm, I need to worship Leto today. No, simply because it is a God that has been forgotten. And to piggyback on to the point that I'm making, is that even as these gods are forgotten gods, there will come a day when Christianity and Islam and Judaism have long since foregone their day of fame, okay, and they will fade into the sunset of time and no one will worship them anymore. It will be just a footnote of someone else's religious text of the day. Whatever God is going to be popular at that particular time, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism would be nothing more than a footnote Okay, in, in the modern religious writings of that day. Even as people now do not worship Mithras in the mainstream, even as they do not worship Hercules or Thor in the mainstream, you will find that if you live long enough, the mainstream religions of today being the major three, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, in that order, they all will fade into time and they will not be worshipped anymore. Which is another reason why I find it absolutely ridiculous that anybody should kill anybody because they're not believing in their particular religion. Especially when the Catholic Church used to torture for Jesus. They were torturing for the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. They're torturing for Jesus. They would come to your village and they would literally torture you uh, until you said, yes, I want to be saved. Or they would kill you if you did not allow them to save your soul from the hell that they were putting you through. Okay, but now it, it's, it's so, uh, to me, brothers and sisters, I got to say, when I think about the reality of it all, the fact that gods come and gods go, did you hear what I said? Gods come and gods go. And so for anyone to be so hot and heavy over a particular God and a particular religion, listen, brothers and sisters, back in the day they were worshiping Hercules, okay? And Hercules is nothing more than a, a comic book figure nowadays. He's no more than a makeshift superhero, nothing more than mythology. But guess what? Back in the day they were worshiping Hercules strong. They were worshiping Hercules, and guess what? Hercules was said to be God and man rolled up into one package. Doesn't that sound familiar? 
And at the same time, they were worshiping uh, Hercules, they were worshiping Buddha, they were worshiping all of these different gods were being worshipped. And men were giving their lives to these different gods. Men were fervently seeking out the will of these gods. Every one of these gods had priests. Every one of these gods had people serving, uh, you know, this particular deity. And people had, you know, all these gods had edifices and shrines and candles were lit and incense were burned and prayers were offered. And to all of these gods that we know nothing about today... Guess what? Yeah, people were living their lives thinking that their, their lives found great value in the worship of that particular God, which today is not even mentioned. It's not. Listen, some of these gods aren't even a footnote in the major religious texts of today. But guess what? They were worshipped hot and heavy in their day. Now, that being the first point that I want to make is that gods come and gods go. Now. When you begin to think about religion, and when you begin to think about the whole religious factor that humanity goes through, you will understand something very simple. That religion is something that you are not born with. What? what? Exactly. You were not born with a religion. You were born with a spirit, but you weren't born with a religion. Religion, just like tying your shoes, just like learning the language or mother tongue of your people. Religion, just like learning how to drive, learning how to walk. Religion, just like learning how to button your shirt. Religion, just like learning not to say no to mama, not to say no to daddy, and you will get slapped. Religion has to be learned because religion is nothing more than another facet of an individual's culture, which, as we mentioned to you before in another show, another podcast, that religion is something that is soulish in nature, but it's, it's physical. It, it's relegated to this physical realm. In other words, when you're a spirit, okay, if we could run the clock up 10,000 years from now, when you are existing in spiritual form, okay, uh, you will not have a culture per se. Why? Because culture is a physical thing. It relates to the physical world. It relates to the world of human beings that have bodies. Or I should say, it relates to the world of divine beings that have physical bodies. And we call those humans. Well, my point is that since culture is physical, Religion is also physical, therefore temporary. It must be taught, and it can be easily forgotten. Okay? So religion within itself, it has to be taught. You weren't born with a religion, but you were born with a spirit. And so this is why, brothers and sisters, today I put the emphasis on being spiritual and not being religious. Now let's just talk about this for a second as we begin to talk about invented gods. Because religion as a whole, when you look at what religion does, oh, 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 oh wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's let's even use Christianity for an example. You know, and I know some of you may say, man, he always he always talking about Christianity. Why? How come he don't ever talk about Islam? How come he? Listen, I'm gonna get to Islam. I'm gonna get to Judaism. In fact, I am an equal opportunity truth teller. I will speak about Islam, I will speak about Judaism, in fact, I often uh, bounce around and speak about them all. But you know what? Uh, Christianity is the big dog on the block, and so I usually start there, okay? My philosophy is take care of the worst first, so I start with Christianity. Well, now, uh, looking at this and thinking about this, brothers and sisters, okay, let's take a look at Christianity, and let's look at the role that Christianity has, has had in this nation, and even within our own uh, demise. Okay, look at the maafa that the black people have suffered by means of slavery, by means of the degradation of their culture. Okay, the the denigration of their heritage, the ruining, the raping, the pillaging of their value and self worth. Okay, the demonization of the culture of African peoples. Who is standing in the wings? Who is standing in the shadows giving God's blessings on all of these things? Who gave God's blessings to bring about the first acts of slavery and the enslavement of African peoples and Chinese peoples and peoples all over the planet? It was the universal church called the Catholic Church that gave the blessing to begin to enslave 
uh, Africans and bring them into wholesale slavery. Okay? And then it was also in later times that Catholicism within itself ordained and dictated that it was God's will to not only enslave the African, but to also mistreat the African because he was then considered to be a heathen. Now, strike the fact that they gave the Africans Christian names and made them, okay, later on made them to become Christians, okay? Uh, we remind you that the uh, preacher was invented, the black preacher was invented on the slave plantation in 1790. Massa gave him a top hat, taught that Negro how to read the Bible, and guess what? It was over for black folk from that day forward because we had nowhere to go socially, okay, mentally, spiritually. We had nowhere to go, but guess what? Christianity gave us hope that one day, by and by, when these trials are over, oh, glory. I will fly away, and, and God is going to reward me for everything that I've suffered. And it became nothing more than a drug, an opiate, that anesthetized the minds and the hearts of the Africans that were suffering. Okay, Malcolm put it like this. When you go to the dentist, he shoots Novocaine in your mouth so that you will suffer peaceably. So that you will suffer calmly what he's putting you through. So that you will suffer without yelling, without screaming, or without feeling a thing. And that is what religion does. Religion is the bedwinch of political oppression. Okay? Religion is the bedwinch. Religion is the bedwinch of political and governmental oppression. You have to have, just like in the movie The Matrix, you have to have that feminine essence to get into the mind. See, see notice what the oracle was. I, I know, I know. Look, I'm going back in time. I'm talking about The Matrix. But y'all understand where, where I'm going with this, okay? Yeah, The Matrix, it's a good movie. It is a timeless movie. And yes, I reference it because uh, it is a little bit of mythology that, that points to the true spirit of our reality in the matrix you had neo going to see the oracle right but then wait a minute uh, i believe it was in the second uh matrix epic where yeah uh neo says look you, hey you a program just like the machines i'm fighting you are part of the problem you are part of the program and she said, you don't know whether to believe that. And then she says, bingo, you know. So, so in essence, every system of the matrix has to have a feminine representation, has to have a feminine form of deity that is able to finesse and caress and get all up into the mind and the heart and the feelings of those that are being manipulated, which is why some of the most influential deities in the Roman era were those feminine deities such as Medea, what, what we call Medea today, right? The Medea who would work her magic and transform individuals into animals so that she could consume them, all right? And we won't even talk about capitalism in relation to that, but you all understand where I'm going. You have to have that feminine energy in order to finesse and, and you know, connive and cajole and do whatever was necessary in order to get into the mind of the individual. All right, uh, which is why you know the the patriarchal system hated women because the woman has the ability to soothe and to uh, you know hey to even hypnotize a brother. I mean, some of us you know uh, those of us that aren't pimps, right? Uh, the, <laughs> a lot of brothers get hypnotized by these sisters out here, right? Because of that feminine energy. All right, that that feminine, you know, the softness, the beauty, the the calmness, everything that a woman is. Hey, it knocks some of our brothers to our knees. Look at the story of Samson. Samson, strongest man in Old Testament mythology. Guess what? That Negro got knocked down to his knees when, uh, <laughs> yeah, when that sister came along because she was the only one that could finesse him enough to remove his strength from him. And guess what? That feminine energy is also represented in every system of matrix. Uh, and I'm sorry, in every matrix system, that feminine energy is represented in order to get into the minds and the hearts and to manipulate and to hypnotize and to, you know, to break down the defenses of that strong brother, that strong warrior, okay, uh, and, and, and in order to get in there and mess things up. Well, religion is the feminine consort of the political dictator of society. In other words, 
once again, religion is the bedwench of governmental and political oppression. So what does that mean? In every system of governmental control, you will have a system that can be represented in feminine form that is always there beside that overlording government system, and she does the work of preparing the individual for her master's rule. Okay, And religion does that for government. Religion does it. And why do you think that the United States government pays the church? I know they told you that there was a separation between church and state. No, Mr. and Mrs. Negro. Listen, the issue of it is the reason why the church receives 501c3 tax-exempt status, it is payment. Okay, They get a free blank check. They don't have to pay federal taxes because they are being paid by the government because they are keeping the people huddled in their masses with their minds waiting for a deliver, which serves the political system of oppression. Okay, Because, once again, what religion does is religion prepares the individual for that one to come in and to be a savior. Because that's what religion talks about, a savior. Okay, A savior is going to come. A savior is going to deliver you. And what do we expect politicians to do every time we try to vote on them? Guess what? We want them to come and save us and deliver us out of our particular situations, which are really situations that they put us in in the first damn place, right? But then we're going to run to them, and they're going to save us. Okay, And really, they're the bad guy and the good guy. But guess what? This is the same thing you find out when you look at these different gods, because like I said before, gods come and gods go. All right? I want to make sure that you get that. I want to make sure that you flow with that. So, hey, gods come, gods go. I'm going to make my point number two in just a moment. Okay? I'm going to make my point number two in just a moment. And we want you to stick with us right here on WKHR Radio. God is love, Give but he hates all for no reason. Mm. Y'all don't hear me. Come on, musicians, get behind me one time. You may not believe this, doctor, but it's true anyhow. God loves you, but he'll send you to hell forever. Jesus took care of the devil, but put on your whole armor. Are you tired of nonsensical doctrines that do not make sense and those things being taught in church as being truth but really aren't true? Christianity cannot answer the question that if God has all power, then why doesn't he once and for all destroy the devil, knowing that he's going to kill, steal, and destroy his children? Why is it that God would allow Satan out of prison in the book of Revelation after 1,000 years? Well, Christianity can answer these questions, but we invite you to entertain the question with us. The new DVD, The Caress of Sutek, is now available. We will discuss the questions of good and evil. We will discuss the questions revolving around why God cannot and will not ever destroy the devil. We discuss duality. We discuss that which is pertinent for your understanding in negotiating a godlike existence in this world. Go to www.wkhradio.com and for a $15 donation, the caress of Sutek or the resurrection of Seth can be yours and so much more. Right back at your brothers and sisters, the first point that we made was that gods come and they go. Now, let's talk about the spiritual system whereby gods are invented. Now, I'm going to first of all reverse the scenario concerning the first point. Now, remember I read to you those gods, Leto, Thales, Hercules. Okay, I, I mentioned them. And I made the point that you haven't heard of them, okay? And that during the the time that they were being worshipped, people were very serious about them. But now, let's also reverse this so that I can make point number two. 
during the time that Hercules was being worshipped, during the time that Leto was being worshipped, during the time that Quetzalcoatl was being worshipped, no one heard of Jesus Christ, Christianity, Muhammad, or Moses, or any of them. So what is the point that I'm making? The point that I'm making is, is that the gods that we now worship, or the gods that are in the mainstream of society and being worshipped and receiving a lot of energy, these gods were not even around. They were not even a forethought in the people's minds. So the gods that are now being worshipped are the inventions of cultures and societies, okay, as these cultures and societies found it necessary for their political success. Now, nowhere is this pointed out more pointedly than in the Roman government, where Constantine decided that he was going to adopt Christianity and make Christianity the major religion of Rome. Now, despite the fact that Constantine, even during the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, he was not a Christian. He was not even pretending to be a Christian. And he was not baptized until his deathbed experience uh, when he was, I don't know how old, what, 70, 80, however old he was when he was on his deathbed. In fact, he led a very hellish life. He killed, killed his wife, killed his women, did this, did that, did whatever he desired to do, okay? And he later allowed himself to be baptized just to say that, of course, he was a Christian. But he never lived the life of a Christian. He never even believed in the Christianity that he himself uh, uh, arranged to be the state religion. He didn't believe in it. Why? Because he knew the truth. He knew the truth that the Christ character now being worshipped was a major invention by the political arena of his day. He knew that the Christ that is now being worshipped is nothing more than a piecemeal put together quilted entity that was brought about by government means, government funding. Okay, and of course, Constantine knew this. That's why Constantine wasn't studying no Christianity. He wasn't even studying, you know, I'm saying, I'm saying it like Grandma used to say it, right? Well, wasn't studying no Christianity because he knew the origins thereof. Okay, now, the reason why Constantine wanted to flow with Christianity was because he saw what value it would be for the Roman Empire. Once again, religion is the bedwinch of governmental and political oppression. So there had to be another god invented. Now let's talk about the inventing of gods and how that happens. How are gods invented? One of the major ingredients that you need in order to invent a god is, number one, you need a good story. You need a story that is believable. Or not even so much as believable, but, a, you know, you need a story that is accepted. Okay? You need the right template. It's just like all the movies that you watch. When you, when you watch a movie, guess what? The hero goes through this, you know, the hero's got a bad time. The hero's been wrong. The hero's been dogged out. This enemy arises. The hero has, has got to get the victory over the enemy. Um, the, the, the hero usually suffers some sort of personal uh, plight, some sort of personal tragedy. You know, his family is attacked. His, uh, you know, I mean, something happens where the hero always goes through a problem. Their family is attacked, they're they're personally wounded, and now you gotta watch this 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 hero go from nothing and pull themselves up by their bootstraps and then win the victory. This scenario and template is played out in mythology, it's played out by Hollywood over and over and over again. Even in some of our movies, it's played out all over again. And it's the same template, it's the same story that's being used. Well guess what? This is also done in religion. There is a template for religion that is played over and over and over again. And one of the motifs of religion has been, guess what? You have a dying and rising Savior. And this Savior comes, and this Savior suffers, and this Savior dies, but this Savior rises again. And then everybody marches off to victory with this particular Savior. And it's happened over and over again that this particular story... 
since it's a good story, it always works because it taps into the human psyche and it causes the individual to identify with the suffering hero because every one of us want to be victorious. We want to be the heroes of our own particular lives for our own families and in our own situations. We want to make it. We want the victory. Okay. What is Reverend Fatback uh, praying for? He's praying that God give him the city. What are all these preachers praying for? That God's going to open up the windows of heaven and send us down to bless. Yeah, everybody wants to be blessed. Everybody wants to be victorious. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read something. <laughs> Sorry about that. I need to read something. And uh, I want you to—I want you to just listen to. I want you to listen to what I have to say here because what I'm going to do is I'm going to read something that I feel makes this point. Okay, uh, I'm going to be reading from the book, and, and those of you, I like sharing the information that I get this uh, my information from. The book is Man, God, and Civilization by John G. Jackson. Man. God and civilization, okay? And uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to be reading to you is uh, a, a portion that talks about the different gods and what's going on and so forth and so on with, with religion as a whole, okay? Um, my goodness, there's so much in here that I want to read, that I feel like I should read. But he says here that... In every culture, in every society, there were people that had a passion play and a religious expression that worships their God and that gives their God victory over the enemies where the God dies and rises again and then enters into a glorious situation and is worshipped by people and there is more times than not an empty tomb does that sound familiar there is an empty tomb that is displayed to show the gods victory okay and the interesting thing about it brothers and sisters is that this template this uh, story, it, it goes over and over and over again. That's why when you take a look at the gods that have been invented, they've all been invented with the same story, with the same template, if you will. They're all cut out of the same cookie, with the same cookie cutter, all right? And these gods, they all have the same things that they go through, all right? And then one of the things I want to say about these gods is, you know, even in the Old Testament, many people don't realize that there are dying and rising saviors in even the Old Testament. When you look at the Old Testament, there is Tammuz, okay? Tammuz, T-A-M-M-U-Z. Look it up. Tammuz is in the Bible, and women would weep for Tammuz because every fall, as the leaves turn red, they would say it is the blood of their god, Tammuz, coming up through the ground. Does not that sound familiar? God told uh, Cain that his, blood, that his brother's blood cried unto him from the ground. Where the women would look at the red leaves and say, Oh, it is the blood of Tammuz. Tammuz is down in hell fighting for us. And his blood has come up through the leaves, letting us know that he's winning the victory. And he's fighting for us. He's suffering. But he's going to rise again. And so Tammuz was worshipped as a dying and rising savior. Also, Baal... Okay, B A A L, Baal or Bel, okay, uh, was also worshipped as a dying and rising savior. And you notice that in the Old Testament, that these gods were, once again, these gods were made evil of. They were, no, 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 you don't worship Baal, you don't worship any of these gods, you're supposed to worship Yahweh. Well, now today, we have a god that supposedly supersedes Yahweh, and they call his name Jesus. And guess what? He is another dying and rising savior just like all of the other ones that originally were not supposed to be worshipped so then let's talk about how gods are invented now here my brothers and sisters here's where we get deep i got to get deep for about five minutes right and uh, and then we're going to once again check the emails and make sure that uh you know we're taking care of all of our comments now how do you invent a god how do you invent a deity 
Okay, this is how you invent a deity. First of all, you need a story that will sell. So what they did was they took the template of what the sun goes through. Every December 25th, the sun goes through a cycle where the sun looks like it has died because it ceases to give its strength. It hangs low in the horizon. And for three days, the sun stays there, okay? Also, the moon. The moon also disappears. And so three days becomes something that is very important when it comes to watching the stars, looking at the zodiac signs, looking at what the sun does. They notice, the ancients notice, that at December 21st, the sun seems to stop. They call that the solstice, which means sun stop or sun kill. Okay, because they thought that the sun was dead, so they called it a solstice. Sol meaning sun, okay, and solstice meaning that the sun has died or that the sun has stopped or that the sun has ceased. Now, that being the case, brothers and sisters, on the 21st, the sun stands, seemingly stands still in its, in its, uh, in its rising. It doesn't rise any higher than that very, very low point on the horizon. It does that for three days. But guess what? On the fourth day, the sun rises because it goes up one degree. And from there, it continues to arise until it regains the fullness of its strength. And guess when it regains the fullness of its strength, brothers and sisters? It is said to regain its strength, okay, at the vernal equinox. So what, so what, does, <laughs> what do those who watch the stars do? They say, well, we're going to have a holiday. And guess what? We're going to celebrate it on the first Sunday after the vernal equinox. And do you know what they call that today? They call it Easter. If you notice on your calendars, brothers and sisters, Easter, listen, listen I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Go on the Internet and just get a bunch of calendars from, you know, go four or five years back. And I challenge you. Look up the day that is celebrated as Easter, and I will guarantee you that you will not find the same numerical date in the same month, okay? Because Easter is not about anyone rising from the dead. Easter is about the sun rising and getting to its highest point where now the days are longer than the darkness of night which to the ancients said we have the victory over darkness uh, you know light supersedes darkness yeah we won the victory once again and so all that is dark must now bow its knee to that that is light and so they said oh yeah the sun has given us the victory and so this is what Easter is all about Easter is all about when the sun overrides the darkness and the days become the longest and the nights become the shortest showing that the sun now has the victory even though the sun was going through in the winter time, couldn't arise in its height, couldn't melt the snow, couldn't keep things warm, couldn't keep vegetation. So all of this is portrayed, brothers and sisters, in the stories and in the mythologies of these gods. That's why Osiris was killed, okay, and then rose again. That's why Haru died and rose again. That's why Jesus died and rose again. The sun is risen, right? Yeah, of course, the sun is risen. Because it all points to what's happening with the stars, what's happening with the sun. I'm sorry if I have pulled the rug out from some of you and, and, and said something that you were shocked about. I know many of you aren't, but some of you may be. And, and my point is this, brothers and sisters. The gods are invented by means of putting forth a very popular story. The god suffers, then the god gets the victory. Oh, this god is the greatest god that there is because now he has the victory. Um, Osiris had a open tomb ceremony where people worshipped and was glad that his tomb was empty. Okay. Uh, also for Mithras and also for Baal. They all had open tombs to show that they were victorious and that they had the victory over their enemies. Okay, so 
you need a popular story. Now, after you have a popular story, which, by the way, the Catholic Church or the Universal Church, in their system of proselytization and in their system of inquisition, they made sure that it was their story that superseded all others. During the Dark Ages, they took away all of the other literature from the other people that believed differently. Okay, which is why they stomped away Gnosticism, they stomped away any other version of Christianity and any other version of any other God that was that was popular. They stomped it out, went through a period of dark ages whereby they allowed all the other gods to to die, uh, their belief systems to die out. And then they listen, man, they went like 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 crazy just into pumping out Christianity. And if you don't believe in Christianity, we're going to torture you. If you don't believe in Christianity, we're going to kill you. And what they were doing uh, was they were making their God to become the supreme God and the number one God, okay? And they had to allow things to die out, which is why Theodosius closed down all of the temples in Kemet for 400 years to completely eradicate the worship of Ra and Amun and all of the masculine and feminine manifestations of God. They had to weed it out, and so one way that you get a God to die is you cease to mention it. And isn't it interesting that the ancients would say that you live on forever as long as your name is repeated after you've gone. And so when they cease the worship of these different gods, that's when that God died out. Now, let's begin to talk about a, 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 a very deep portion of creating a God. You first of all have to have a popular story. Okay. Well, you have to have a story that is that is accepted. Then you have to make that story popular. Okay. Now, next, in order to invent a God, you have to have people believing in that God on one accord. Now, what does this do? Okay. For anyone that has ever, for anyone that has ever sat around with your people and start telling ghost stories and stories about haints and you know i was i'm you know i was in that house and that house was haunted man you get to talking about ghosts and you will notice something there will be a funny feeling in the room people will start thinking that they see stuff kids will go to bed afraid to hang their feet off the bed why because you have given energy to all that spooky stuff and you really you, listen you have literally energized the ghost-like spirits and the energies that are close to this realm that desire to manifest. And you will hear something, and if you keep it up, you will see something, all right? Uh, I could tell you stories, okay, and just might. Um, thing about it is, you know, the same thing happens in religion. After you have the story that is accepted, after you have people believing in that story, you have to get people to begin to invest spiritually in that particular God. And so you have to have that God praised continually over and over and over and over again every service. Okay, and you have to do it. You you have to you have to have that God praised over and over again. You got to talk about what that God has done and what that does, brothers and sisters, in the realms of the spirit. It causes that particular entity that was just created by the unified thought of all the people together. It creates an entity that gains strength. And that then has a consciousness of all of its own. And in the realms of the spirit, it's called a thought form or an egregore. Now, many of you have heard me talk about this before. For those of you that have spiritual terrorism one and two, you know that I talk about this. Okay. And I go into some depth about it. Okay. But the issue of it is in order to invent a God, you have to have a story and you have to make that story to be believed. And then you have to have people to actually worship and give energy to that particular God. Now, let's play with this for a minute. Because by the mere definition of a God, a God is self-sufficient. A God doesn't need anybody. A God doesn't need anything. A God needs absolutely no one at all. Because guess what? God is God, right? If no one else exists, that God will exist. And hey, 
that God can create and do whatever that God wants to do. But wait a minute. When you go to the Christian church, the Christian church mandates that you got to give God praise. Give God the praise. You know, and when you go to the church, guess what you hear? Oh, y'all don't want to praise God. I wish I had somebody that would want to praise God. Oh, give praise to Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And you have to always go through these gyrations and just praise, 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 praise. Okay, when realistically, by the mere definition of a God being a God, God does not need you to praise him or her. A true God does not need you to praise them. Okay, because that God is not going to be now. Now, I'm talking about that God that is really the one and true God, right? Uh, that God does not need you to praise them in order to exist, in order to do miracles, because God will do whatever in the hell God wants. <laughs> That's funny, right? God will do whatever in the hell God wants to do just because God is God, right? But when you look at the system that is laid down by Christianity and Islam, and Judaism, you must give God praise. You must not say anything bad about God. You must, you know, and, and so the, the, the entity is to be worshipped. And what happens in the realms of the spirit, brothers and sisters, is that you worship that particular entity, no matter what you call it. You can call it Quetzalcoatl. You can call it whatever name you want to call it. You can call it Baal. You can call it Ra. You can call it anything. When you give enough focus, enough attention, and enough worship to that spiritual entity, it will live by your force of power and by your concentration alone. And it will live to the point to where it will respond to you and it will give you feelings and it will feed you. It will talk to you mentally. Why? Because it wants to keep being fed. It You have made it to live. You've made it become alive. You've made it to become an entity that now exists in the planes of the spirit. And realistically, brothers and sisters, it is a piece of your spirit that you have projected away from yourself and seemingly detached from yourself and allowed yourself to think that it is separate from you when really it is a piece of you. That's why you feel it. Okay? And that egregore or that thought form interacts with you. Okay? And there is even a system of interaction. Let me talk about that for a minute. The system of interaction always involves a certain genre of music. Okay? For every God that exists, there is a certain, I don't care whether it's um, instrument less music, such as in the, in the um, Islamic call to prayer. Okay? Uh, I, I won't even do it on the air, but, but you know what the Islamic call to prayer is. When that happens, there is something that happens in the psyche and in the minds and in the spirits of those that hear it. Because it is a call from Allah to pray. It is, you know, it, that is a time that you come and you present yourself to Allah. And so immediately when that is heard, it becomes a psychological trigger that opens up that fee those feelings of veneration, awe, and inspiration that is given to that particular spiritual entity that was created by the masses of the people in the first damn place. Okay? And the same thing happens in Christianity. Okay? Now, 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 listen. I've got about five minutes left. And in checking the email, I see where uh, Brother Hassan, Ma'adhotep to you, Brother Hassan, he says that I, I just logged in about 20 minutes ago, and he says I'm already loving what I hear. Thank you very much. Uh, those of you that want to, you can feel free to email. Uh, I know that you are listening. I know that you are really concentrating on what you're hearing. Uh, but feel free to email your comments and your questions. I've got five minutes left. In fact, ten if I want to give you an hour. And I'm going to give you an hour. So I've got ten minutes left. So, I'm going to now tell you, oh boy, you know what, I may get in trouble for this, right? There may be someone, <laughs> that, listen, there may be someone listening that, uh, that I may get in trouble with, but you know what, you know what, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do this because I want you to understand, okay? Now, all right, I'm going to let the cat out the bag, family. I don't want anybody to be scared out there, okay? I want you to flow with me on this, and I, I just simply want you to understand what I'm saying. I created an entity. 
Oh, what? What? You, you, uh, yeah. Because, uh, and let me just flub with this for a moment, okay? And I'm going to be real basic with it. Don't uh, Listen, don't be scared. L- leave the station on, all right? Don't be scared. Just relax, relax, relax. It's all good. Relax. Because you do the same thing. Yes, you create entities, okay? Uh, many of you create your own entities that cause mayhem and destruction in your life. And you literally talk into existence negative forces in your life that brings negative things to pass in your life. You keep talking about it. You keep giving energy to it. And guess what? In the realms of the spirit, Mr. and Mrs. Negro, you actually created your own emissary of doom and destruction. And this is how it works. You see, you are a divine being. You have infinite spirit, even as the creator has infinite spirit. Ooh, what? Yes. Let me put it to you like this. Okay. God is infinite, right? Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Okay. We're going to have to go to school on this one. So I'm ringing the school bell. School bell has rung. It's time to really, really buckle down and learn something. God is infinite. Now, the one thing about an infinite God, I don't care what you call him, the one true creator is infinite. Now, an infinite God gives unto his creation a portion of his spirit. But wait a minute. He gives his spirit and puts his spirit in a physical body and calls that individual a man. All right? Or a woman. We've got to be politically correct. Well, think about it for a second. We said that God, who is a spirit, according to St. John 4 and 23, God is infinite in spirit. So therefore, if God gives you a portion of his spirit, the little piece that he gives you is also infinite because God is infinite. And for you to have a piece and portion of God in you also gives you that same bit of spirit that is also infinite. In other words, God gave you a piece of him that is an unending piece. Okay. And so the God that is in you is just as infinite as the God that originated all of creation. Wow. Yeah, exactly. You are a divine being. You have endless potential. You have divine potential because you are created in the image and in the likeness of God. Therefore, since God is eternal, since God is infinite, guess what? That spirit within you that also belongs to God is also infinite and eternal, and there is no end to what it can do. Now, I trust that everybody is with me. In fact, we need some thinking music for this next session, okay? Here we go. Here's some thinking music for you, okay? A man and woman comes together, and when they get together physically, mentally, spiritually, they create an individual that also has a spirit. Now, wait a minute. What has happened when the man and woman comes together? Well, when they come together, they have... An entity that they have created that is a human being that also has a spirit. So wait a minute, what has just happened? They too created a spirit. And so their spirits split, joined together, and is infused in that child. Now that child is a little bit of mama and that child is a little bit of daddy. But guess what? The potential of mama and daddy is in that child spiritually. That's why the child got some of mama and daddy's hang-ups. Okay? So, let's, let's continue this forward a little bit. Just as the man and woman are able to come together and spiritually split themselves and put a part of their spirit into a little baby that becomes a child and later becomes an adult, guess what? Your spirit has the ability to split and to become a separate piece of you. Ooh. What? Yes. You didn't know that about yourself, did you? Yeah. And guess what? When you give energy to negativity, you are taking a piece of your spirit and you are investing it in negativity and you're actually separating a part of yourself to war against yourself and to fight yourself and to be your own enemy. 
And you can also create your own angels. Ooh, man. Okay, look, 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 look. look. I know. <laughs> listen, listen. I know some of y'all have got to be like, oh, man, I don't believe he just said that. You are able, and I know this gets deep, okay? Maybe I'm going deeper than what I should into this. Maybe we need to talk about this more. But my point is your spirit has the capacity to separate and exist and do things Okay. And exists outside of your physical body. What do you think happens when you dream? You're laying there on your bed and guess what? Your spirit goes traveling in different times and different places, different spaces. And then it comes back into your body and guess what? You wake up and then when you get to that experience, you have that feeling of deja vu. Mm, I feel like I've experienced this before. Yeah, you have experienced that before. Because your spirit is able to separate. Your spirit is able to go and do a number of different things. Why? Because God's spirit is able to separate from him and herself and reside in your body. Which is why the Bible says, and many other ancient holy books say, that when you die, that part of God that God gave you is going to go back to God and commune with God. Okay? So... The spirit that you have is able to separate and it is able to do things. You are able to establish. Oh, okay, listen, I'm not I'm not gonna get that deep with it, okay? Uh I need to just <laughs> I don't I don't want to get too deep to where I lose a number of you, but listen, listen to me when I tell you. I did create an entity. You can call it an angel. Okay? I gave a particular name to this angel. Right? Oh, he did something me. No, I didn't do anything evil. This was an angel that blesses. This was an angel. And you know what? I realized what it was. It was a facet of me because I am a divine being that seeks to bless and love. But you know what? I realize that a lot of what I'm saying, even tonight, it's deeper than many of you shallow people. out. Um, listen, okay, listen. It, it's deeper than what many of you may want to understand because many of us, we've been, we haven't even been weaned from the tit of Christianity yet enough to understand the deep things about the spirit. So we, we, we keep, we keep spending time with Mickey Mouse stories, never getting deeper than the surface. When there is a lot of truth out there, there's a lot of spirituality out there that is meant to be experienced and you are not growing spiritually because you keep hanging around the shallow end of the pool rather than launching out into the depths. You're afraid of it. You don't want it. You don't want anything that, that even resembles death because you are comfortable just doing a little bit of nothing, learning nothing, but saying amen every now and then. And you are comfortable with that. You are comfortable with going to the church or going to the village, hearing about how to hate the white man. And you are comfortable with that. You're not about, you're not about tapping into spirit and moving in spirit, hearing in spirit and evolving spiritually into the divine being that you were intended to be. Many of you are just stuck in that level of complacency where all you want to do is be comfortable. Don't challenge me with anything. Don't make me think anything else. Don't take me to into any new territory. I don't want to go. I don't want to know. I don't want to learn. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you're about to get left behind. You're about to get left, okay? You're about to get left behind because this is about spiritual evolution. It's about you becoming the best that you could possibly be. It's about you being the divine image that the creator meant for you to be. And the only way you're going to do that, brothers and sisters, is by evolving. Well, listen, brothers and sisters, we've checked our email, and uh, we have sufficiently addressed every email that was sent to us. And I want to let you know that I've enjoyed this moment, this session that we've had with you. Join us again next week, and guess what? Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try to have this uploaded to iTunes. Go to iTunes, and of course, search under my last name, Up Church, and there will be two podcasts that come up, and this will be on Tracing the Steps of Truth podcast. Brothers and sisters, I love you, I appreciate you, and we will come back next week with another live show. And uh, feel free to email us and let us know what you want to hear. I am your perpetual host, ES Up Church, telling you to be strong, forever arise on the wings of Ra. 
shed as much love and light upon all those in darkness as you possibly can. Love from the depths of your being and evolve spiritually. Be the divine being that the Creator meant for you to be. Be all that you can be for the Creator. So, Ma'at Hotel, we love you, and we will now return you back to our regularly scheduled broadcast. Thank you, and I love you. <laughs>